Alrighty, it is right on 1.40, so I like to reward people who came here on time. Hopefully you've had plenty of food, you've seen some great talks this morning, and you're here for the afternoon sessions. So today we're talking about AI and the future of work. It will include some awesome, cool new things that are uh, coming as part of AI, and also a little bit about um, the, the AI landscape as we're calling it today. But before we jump into that, uh, my name is uh, Mish Manners. I work on the developer relations team at GitHub. This is our beautiful, cute as team Octocat. And if you want one of those stickers, you can come and ask me. Um, I can give you some of those. So uh, we're GitHub. You can follow us on pretty much every social media platform known to man, um, including TikTok. We do have a TikTok now, which is really awesome. Uh, and you can also follow me as well um, on the social medias. So if you'd like to tweet about this, if you'd like to Instagram it, feel free to, to do that. And that's my little Octocat up the top there, which you can also build using um, GitHub's My Octocat Generator. Now, if you do tweet, I will choose probably two people today. I think I'll choose two people today who tweet about the talk, put some photos, put some great quotes, whatever you like to do, and I'll choose two people to win some fun GitHub swag and I'll reply to your tweet. So that's always a good incentive. But what are we covering today? So this talk, we're going to talk a bit about what is work, because I feel like this week we kind of need to go back a little bit to talk about like the future of work. Let's talk about first about the concept of work and what it is. We'll go into this industry 4.0, what it is, how it's actually relevant to us today. And we'll talk about this, uh, this concept of the future of work. What is it if you haven't heard about it already? Um, and how does it relate to uh, some of the jobs and things that we're doing? As part of that, we'll go into artificial intelligence. We'll talk about actually what is AI before jumping into what some of the applications of artificial intelligence are. And you've probably used some of those. And I'll ask you throughout the session. Talk about some soft skills, because I think this is actually really important for the future of work and also to understand our place within the future of work alongside AI. Um, and in that case, we'll be talking about working with AI. Uh, I think it's something that's most likely going to be coming. It's already here. Um, so talking about how we can actually work with AI, which is really good. Uh, but one of the most important things we're going to be coming covering off today is actually how to build resilience, because I think resilience is one of these things that's actually going to ensure we have a job in this new age of future of work. But before we jump into the future of work, let's talk about work first. This concept of work. Now, this is, um, you know, taking back quite a long way. Now, if we talk about work, this is obviously like the farmers tending the land, right? So the concept of work has shifted over generations. Now, back in these times, work was something we did because we needed to survive. If we didn't tend the land, if we didn't um, farm the crops, look after the animals, we didn't actually, we couldn't eat. So we actually had to work for our livelihood in a very different way to what we do today. But I think this concept of work really comes down to this idea of work being us as humans, giving us a purpose. You know, so back in the day, it was obviously, I need to work to feed myself, to feed my family, to feed my village. I have a purpose, I have a role to play in society. So when we're talking about work and the future of work and, and today, um, I think this idea of like purpose and having a, a job or a role to play is really, really important. But over the years, now this is obviously back in the day, um, you know, work was centred around like labouring. So this idea of tending to the farm and working the land. And as we move throughout the ages, the type of work we did shifted because we wanted to make things easier. Now, this is obviously jumping forward um, a few centuries. So now in this picture, though, we can see like it, the same thing is still happening, right? So we're still working the land. We're still tending to the crops and feeding the animals and ensuring that we can actually provide for ourselves, for our families, for our village, or, you know, in more recent cases, our country. But we wanted to make things easier. You know, why sit around and labour for, you know, days and days when we can make things slightly easier? Moving through, forward through the ages again, we just decided to make things easier and easier. Now, if we look at things and people say, well, obviously we still have agriculture. I know I'm from Australia. Uh, it's a very agricultural centred country. You know, it's quite a lot of space. We have a lot of space to actually grow things. But so agriculture hasn't left. Like this idea of being able to tend the, the land, to work the farm, to 
to grow the crops, to get food, to feed society. That concept hasn't changed. We've just made it easier and easier. Now, if you drive past, um, you know, the fields in Australia, you won't see people, you know, ploughing uh, the land with, you know, little hand axes and things. They've got giant big machinery um, to do a lot of the work for us. Um, and this goes back to this first idea um, of the first industrial revolution. So when we talk about um, industry, you know, 4.0, it's the fourth industrial revolution that took place. The first industrial revolution that took place was in the 18th and 19th century, and that brought this wave of manufacturing. So obviously we're, you know, we're using machines today, but this first wave of industry uh, 1.0 brought with them, you know, the manufacturing era. So this is when people moved from doing a lot of the work on the land to actually doing a lot of the work in factories. Obviously, we still had people tending the land because, you know, we still needed to, um, you know, to grow crops and, you know, get food that way and actually, you know, provide for society. But people started to shift jobs. They started to change what they did. So while some people still worked the land, other people went to work in factories. And obviously, when this came out, came about this first industrial revolution, yes, there were factory workers beforehand. And they were worried about obviously losing their jobs because this new wave of manufacturing came out. There's all these, you know, um, not so much robotics back then, then, but there's a lot of machinery. So workers were worried they were going to lose their jobs. Now, this is back in the 18th and 19th century. We obviously saw agriculture change a lot. We saw the way that things were made obviously change. Things became a lot more uh, mass manufactured. We're able to make things a lot quicker. We're made, able to make things cheaper. But still people were worried about losing their jobs, even back then. However, we know from history, because we are now a fair few centuries uh, from that, time, we know those people didn't lose their jobs, right? Instead, their jobs just changed. Now, if you go into a factory today, um, maybe not so much today, but, but even still, you, people are still present in a factory, right? It's just the jobs they are doing have actually changed. Back in the, um, you know, before the first industrial revolution, you would see people, you know, lines and lines of people like, you know, weaving fabric and, you know, making things by hand. Now, um, I don't know if you, about you guys, but look at that picture. Like, is there anyone really like working? Like no one's physically working with their hands, but they're all still working. You know, someone on his phone, he might be a manager uh, talking to people. We've got someone in the back there packing some boxes. Uh, we've got another person right at the back uh, towards the yellow wall. He's, he's actually like looking at the machinery and um, making sure that the machinery is actually working correctly. So our jobs changed. So we still had work. People still were able to work. Now, obviously they were worried because like, all these new, you know, back then they called them robots as well, but these new machines have come in to steal our jobs. As I said, we know that didn't actually happen. So again, let's come back to this idea of work. So back in the first industrial revolution, people were worried they're gonna lose their jobs. So I think what people are actually more worried about. Because I mean, who is actually, in the audience here, who is actually worried about not working for like 14 hours every day, not actually having to, like having to work, right? When, I mean, when you say that, like most people aren't actually worried about not working. What they're actually worried about is not being able to provide. They're worried about not having money to be able to buy the things they need to provide for their family, for their, their partners, for their community. And I think it comes back to that idea again of not being able to have a purpose in society. I think that's what people are worried about when they talk about this concept of not being able to work. Now, it's a little bit different in tech. I actually quite like my job. Um, you know, a lot of people actually, especially in technology, really like what they do. Um, but other, there's a lot of other people out there, they work because they have to. I need money. I've got to pay the mortgage. I've got to pay the rent. I need food to put on the table. I actually need to do this thing to be able to live. So those people aren't actually worried about not working. What they're worried about is not having money. And the people who are like, you know, in that like smart bracket as well, worried about like not being able to have that purpose. And so in the tech industry, when people are worried about not working, most of them aren't worried about not, um, 
you know, not having to work because, you know, they quite enjoy their job. So that's one thing. They actually enjoy what they do for work, but they're worried then that they will be replaced by computers and by machines. So I think that's what we're really talking about when we're worried about not being able to work. But with each new revolution, now currently we're in Industry 4.0, which I'll get to in a minute, but in every single industrial revolution throughout history, this has been the case. Now, obviously, the first industrial revolution was when manufacturing um, came in and this idea of like not working on the farm. That was 18th, 19th century. The second industrial revolution, we had the era of electricity. So electricity came in, which actually like, you know, catapulted the way we did things. And then we had the third industrial revolution, which actually only happened in like the 90s, which is not that long ago, uh, which was like the, um, the era of computers, automation, you know, we obviously had the web, we had all these new ways of doing things um, in the third industrial revolution. And I think what's for a lot of people in um, today's society, what's kind of scary is the time difference between revolutions is being compressed. So the last industrial revolution was only back in the 90s and now we're currently in industry 4.0, which is this massive rise of automation and um, you know, digital uh, enablement that is coming into every single aspect of society. Now, as in uh, a lot of us here would be working in technology, we've been dealing with a lot of this stuff since the 90s, like since the, the, the wave of computation and the, you know, the rise of automation. So we've actually kind of um, and dealt with this. But the reason this is now the, the industrial revolution or in industry 4.0 is because it's in every single aspect of society right now. Like name a job right now or an industry right now that hasn't been touched by technology, that hasn't been touched by AI and automation. Like it is everywhere right now. And that is one of the main reasons why people are very worried because you know, people had jobs, they were secure for quite a while, people were able to get money. And now what we're seeing is this, people can't keep up. This last industrial revolution was in the 90s. The new one is now. There's not a lot of time between, uh, between revolutions. People are feeling like they're getting left behind. How often have you heard like friends or family saying that? I feel like I'm being left behind. And you know, things are moving too quickly. We know technology moves very, very quickly. So the problem with the Industrial Revolution is that it's just like changed just so dramatically into every single aspect. Now, I like to look at this photo too. I'm a bit of a car person. This kind of makes me a little bit sad that there's like no one actually working on, on the car. Um, you know, I like... Uh, modding my car, modding my vehicle. I've got, I've got two in the garage at the moment now. And it's, it's really fun to work on it and to, you know, to build our car and, and you know, have a hobby and things like that. But it's not scalable to build every single car like that, right? So we look at this picture here, there's not a person in sight. In fact, the computers or the machines are doing a lot of this automation for us. They're putting the, the parts on the car. They're now able to do a lot of the testing. We don't have to you know, put human life on the line to do a lot of testing in a lot of industries now because we have automation that can do a lot of that for us. But I think the big problem now is people are saying, well, if this is where we're at now, what's actually next? We have automation in every single aspect of our society. So what is actually next? If this is where we're at right now and things are changing so, so rapidly, what's coming next? And a lot of people talk about this concept of the future of work. Now, I started talking about the future of work when I started my first AI company back in 2015, 2016. I started giving some talks on the future of work. Back then, it was a relatively new concept. Some people would say, oh, you know, it's a minority report. Um, you know, it's, it's being able to interact with things and, you know, can kind of think about, or the computer can kind of tell what we're thinking and make decisions and, and do some stuff. That's the future of work. Um, we're, you know, we're able to interact very digitally with the, the world around us. And I think this whole idea of, I think movies actually do a really good job of predicting, well, not so much predicting, but setting the scene for some of the possibilities that could be available or that actually could happen in the future. Another really good one and another personal favourite of mine is Wally. Who's seen Wally? I really like Wally. Um, I think a few parts of Wally are a little bit more like, 
apocalyptic doom and gloom style of like, uh, you know, if you haven't seen it, sorry, spoiler alert, there's an evil robot that's trying to take over all humanity. Um, and I think that's a little bit doom and gloom. And this whole idea that, you know, people decided to go to space to live on these luxurious um, you know, spaceships and be able to play golf all day and not have to work because, you know, nobody wanted to work in Wally. Um, and then everyone became fat and lazy and they ended up staying up there for, you know, hundreds of years. Uh, I think that's a, that's a, it's a different way of looking about uh, the future of work where, you know, the robots are kind of in control and we're kind of at the mercy of machines telling us what to do, even to the point of telling us what to eat in Wally's case and also what to wear as well. Um, I think that's a... I feel like this is a little bit more cynical. I'm a little bit more on the optimistic side. I think robots are going to be, um, uh, you know, help us out a little bit more. Um, but what we're actually seeing is a lot of the stuff in sci-fi movies and a lot of the stuff that people have been talking about and showing, um, you know, in movies or talking about as concepts, even for the last few years, are already happening. So this future of work almost isn't really the future of work anymore. It's, it's work. It's literally already here. Uh, to the point where I was listening on the radio a little while ago and they told people to dial in with like, okay, this AI age is coming, and this is about five years ago, mind you, um, this AI age is coming, dial in if you think you're a robot can do your job in the future. And somebody rang up and said, ah, actually the robot's already doing my job. Um, and he was talking about uh, these fantastic things, self-serve checkouts. Personally, I'm a fan of actually going and talking to the person at the checkout. Um, I, I can ask how their day is going. I can actually just let them do my um, my groceries, especially when these first came out. Eh, wrong. You uh, do not have that in. Please remove the bag. Please get assistance checkout. It turned out that the assistant checkouts are actually helping more than the machines were. But these are becoming a lot more sophisticated now. Um, back in Australia, people were putting through like macadamia nuts as onions. Were people doing that here as well? Like putting, yeah, putting through really expensive food, like really cheap food. Now they've got AI vision tech on this stuff. It's like, you don't have onions in there. Please like remove and redo it. So they're becoming a lot more sophisticated. But robots are already here, right? They're already working in uh, many of the industries that we're already doing. Another one is um, customer service. We actually had a great conversation in the speak room before about ringing up customer service. And, you know, you get the plus one for this person, press two for this person. That's been around for quite a while. However, it's becoming much more sophisticated. How many times have you gone onto a website now and you start chatting to someone and it doesn't actually sound much like a robot anymore. It sounds much more conversational, much more human. So robots are really coming into a lot of the job spaces that previously, say five, 10 years ago, people were saying robots won't be able to do that because humans are much better at it and we understand other people much better and we can have good conversations with other people and actually understand what they want and therefore help them. Now that's changing a lot, right? So I'm going to ask you all to bring out your phones. So pull out your phones if you don't really have it. And let's figure out whether a robot is going to take your job. Now, this is uh, slightly, I'm going to tell you right now, is slightly out of date. I have not been able to find an, a more up-to-date version of this website. But if you go to time.com dash slash robots dash jobs dash machines dash work. In the middle of that screen or in the middle of the article, there is a box where you can enter your job title and it will tell you, once you click on yes, what is the percentage likelihood that a robot is going to take your job? So I want you to do that. And you know, a lot of people in the room, especially when I do this at tech conferences, most people in the room are relatively safe. Um, when I do it at um, less, more technical audience conferences, not as many people safe. Um, so let's see how safe you all are now. Now, so this is often the point in the um, presentation where some people like start giggling and other people like start high-fiving one another. It's like, yes, well, you're obviously safe. So who's, who's safe in the room? Anyone safe? We've got a few people, uh, yep, safe, safe, safe. Anyone who's like, oh, no, I'm not really that safe. Um, so, so this is quite um, interesting. We're going to come back to this. So, um, you know, keep in, that, keep in mind like this, this safe and um, not safe thing. But what I wanted to point out too is that like this kind of stuff 
robots taking jobs, machines coming into play, and your job changing is obviously nothing new. Now, as I said, I've given you some examples from um, you know, the distant future or distant past, but let's have a look at a couple others. This is a very interesting one, writing, because when I tell people about this, oh, this is not a very common known fact, but when writing was first invented, people thought we were going to become dumb. Everyone was like, no, this is, this is a bad idea. We don't want writing because everyone's be going to become dumb. And the reason they thought that was back in the days you had, there was no like, um, you know, written material. You had to remember every single thing. So if you wanted to remember something, they didn't have phone numbers back then, but if you wanted to remember something or you wanted to know something, you had to remember it. And if you couldn't remember it, that's bad luck to you. There's nowhere else to actually put that information. And so people thought, well, if we don't have to use our brains to remember things anymore, we can just write it down. Everyone's going to become dumb. Now, again, we know from history that was not the case. In fact, what happened instead was that there was this massive wave of innovation and invention because all of a sudden people's minds were freed up from the mundane, boring stuff that they had to remember. They could write it all down and they were able to be free to think and invent new things. So it's this big wave of invention. Now, some people think, oh yeah, well, that, that's so far away. We can't even like, you know, comprehend that and like compare it. So I was like, okay, we'll give you a more, um, more close to home example, calculators. Who was at school when like calculators were like becoming a thing? Yeah, a few people, it's great. Um, when, again, when calculators first came out, with mathematics is definitely going to change. You know, this is terrible for mathematics. People are going to be dumb. People aren't going to be able to do equations. These things need to be banned right now from universities and exams. Does everyone kind of remember that? A few people in the room kind of like giggling. Now we know that wasn't the case. What instead happened was we left the calculators to do the boring, easy calculations and we actually changed what we taught in universities. We changed what we actually uh, evaluated and ex examined within these courses because it was no longer required for you to do these hefty long calculations that might take, you know, not so much hours but minutes to do and instead you could do the better stuff. Now I did chemistry at university and when I did chemistry we didn't have to remember all the equations. They gave us a list of all the equations that we needed to know so we didn't actually have to remember these things. Someone said, well, doesn't that make you dumb? Like, shouldn't you have to remember the equation? I'm like, why remember an equation? You can just look it up. It's everywhere. But what we actually learned instead and what they were testing us in the exams was, do we know when to use the equation? Can we actually effectively use the equations? And I think that's what we're doing with calculators as well. So, you know, technology changes the way we do things in universities. It should change the way we actually teach and learn um, and therefore examine. And I think this quote um, is really, really fantastic from a TED talk a little while ago kind of comes into the calculations, but this whole idea of, you know, robots and stuff coming into, you know, the equation, which is uh, machines have calculations, just like the calculators do, but we have the understanding. We know how to use the thing and the tool. We know how to, which equation to use. We know how to use a calculator properly. We know how to write things down effectively so we can look up things easily, so we can free our brains up to do other things. Machines have instructions, but we have a purpose. And again, come back to that idea of purpose and being able to work and have this purpose in life. Machines have objectivity. We have passion. How many times have you heard startup founders being like, oh, I'm so wrecked and tired and, you know, I've got all these things to do, this and this and this, but I really want to do this because I'm really passionate about it. We have this passion. We have this desire to do good most of us, uh, to do good and to actually solve things and make the world a better place. That's why a lot of us in tech, you know, we are like building things, making things better and easier. Um, and we should not worry about what machines can do today. Um, and this again was from a TED talk a few years ago, but we actually should um, think about what they cannot do and strive to think about ways in which we can actually work within with these computers um, because we will need the help of these new computers for the next wave of innovation, for invention, all these kinds of things. And I love this, like, we'll need the help of machines to turn our grandest dreams into reality. Now that's what a lot of us are doing in technology, right? We're building really cool things. 
I work at GitHub, as I mentioned. I don't get, to, I don't really build a lot of the cool things, but I see a lot of the cool things being built and some of the open source projects for people doing to solve world hunger and crime and all these grand things that they're using machines for. And I just think it's actually brilliant. So in terms of the future of work and robotics, like machines, like we're already there. Like we shouldn't be worried about, oh, you know, oh, the robot's gonna come and take our jobs and what are they gonna do? Like they're already here. Like we shouldn't be worrying about what's gonna happen if they get here because they are already here. What we should be worrying about is what is our place within this, uh, this new era and how do we actually work with these? But I, what I think actually has a lot of people really worried too, because you know, a lot of people have you know, seen the industrial revolutions and seen the way that, oh, don't worry, it's, it'll be fine. We as humans are very good at figuring out new jobs to do and it'll be fine. And even if robots come in, it'll be fine. We'll figure out new ways to work with them. But what's got everyone really worried is this idea of artificial intelligence. Now, this is this whole idea that, you know, robots will be able to um, you know, think and you know, do things almost as well as we can as people. And I, this is what's actually got people worried. Now, again, this idea of AI and you know, AI being uh, applicable to a lot of our work and a lot of our industries has been around for several years. Again, when I started my AI company, this stuff was available. The difference within five years ago to now is it's now commercially and personally accessible to pretty much every single person on the planet, as long as you have an internet connection. Uh, before I jump into that though, however, let's have a look at actually what is AI, the definition of AI. Because a lot of people get this like, um, you know, it's slightly, they're, they're kind of a bit um, confused about because of the way that it's talked about in society. And a lot of people say, oh, check out my cool like AI system. And it's like, that's not AI, that's machine learning at best. So there's various levels of AI. Now the first level right down the bottom, which is not AI, is machine learning learning. This is the, the base level that is required to get to AI. So machine learning is training a, a model or a system to understand or do something based on a set of rules or parameters. For example, I did machine um, computer vision, so we taught computers how to recognise stuff. So if I gave it, you know, lots and lots of photos of this drink bottle, it has now learned that if I give it a new photo of that drink bottle, that it now knows what a drink bottle is. How many times have people done those capture code things where it's like click on the photos with like a motorbike in it? Everyone, pretty much everyone's done that, right? Um, that was a not actually to check to see whether you're human or not. That was actually training in a machine learning system. So um, good work, everyone you've trained the AI. So that's the base level that is required to then do AI. So once it learns and it knows what things are and you've taught it something, it can then start thinking for want of a better word. So the very base level of AI is, yes, I know what a drink bottle is now. So if I give it a slightly different picture of a drink bottle, maybe it's a bit smaller, maybe it's a different colour, it goes, that's kind of like what I already know, so I think that's another drink bottle as well. That's kind of like the very, very first basic level of um, artificial intelligence. Then it moves up from there, starting to recognise more things, starting to then um, put uh, decisions and you know make um, uh, assumptions or make suggestions based on the information it has. Then we move up through the uh, the levels of AI. We get to um, to super uh, super intelligence, which is like really really intelligent AI, which is basically um, higher than people. Then we get to uh, singularity, which is the doom and gloom. Uh, robots are going to take over. They are much smarter than people at this stage. They have realised that people are the ones destroying the planet and they decide to kill us all off. I don't know if we'll get to singularity. I also think it's a very doom and gloom, robo-apocalyptic style of AI, but those are the levels of AI. Uh, now, for a much more simplistic um, explanation of that, I love IBM's definition of AI, which is AI leverages computers and machines to mimic the problem solving capabilities and decision making of the human mind. Now that's the part that's got everyone worried because in the past they're like, don't worry, we can work with the computers. We've always figured out how to make uh, jobs for ourselves. And you know, humans will always be really good at interacting with others, um, you know, taking care of other people. And you know, that's never gonna change. And now we're obviously seeing AI actually now has this capability. 
that is very, very similar to humans. Now, I think a lot of the movies and things as well uh, that have been shown throughout the years have kind of given us some of a sense of what uh, this kind of full-blown AI would be. And when I talk to a lot of my uh, friends and family about this, they're like, oh, so it's, it's kind of like Jarvis. I'm like, well, but yeah, it kind of is. Like this whole idea of, you know, a talking robot in your head where it kind of like knows all your preferences and good evening, Mr. Stark, how are you? And, you know, great flying weather today and I've fixed your, uh, your machine and you now have a heart rate of this, this and this. Shall I do blah, blah, blah? Like it, it actually is designed to understand your personal preferences, take into account all the different things that you have, you know, calendars, um, you know, say, say your, your meetings and things you have and provide to you personalised suggestions based on your daily habits. Now, obviously, uh, Jarvis in the movies as well has a couple of different phases. Obviously, the first phase of Jarvis was just the, the model of the AI. And then, um, again, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen um, The Avengers, uh, goes into Age of Ultron where he gets put into a physical body, right? And then even further from that, we get Vision, which is like the good side of Jarvis. And when I start talking about a lot of this AI um, work with people and, you know, the the rate at which AI is changing, a lot of my friends go, oh, so like, how far away are we from getting like Jarvis? You know, Jarvis the, you know, the form and then Jarvis the physical form. And I was like, oh, like we're kind of already there. Um, a lot of this stuff has been available for several years. It's now much more commercially available. And two weeks ago, if I was giving this talk, I would have said, no, we don't quite have Jarvis in physical machines yet, but I don't think it'll take very long. Last week, they just announced the very first all-purpose AI robot, which actually has a physical form. And I think it was OpenAI that actually put ChatGPT5 into a physical humanoid robot form. So we're actually getting much, much closer. Now, obviously, it's not as intelligent as uh, Jarvis is portrayed in the movie. However, we know that um, you know, the, the way that the large language model of um, OpenAI is being trained, that it won't actually take long. But you know, some other closer examples of, um, of AI that you may have used yourself is who's got a phone in the room? Pretty much everyone, right? Your Hey Siri's, your Alexa's, your Cortana's. These are all like very simplistic versions of AI, you know, understanding some of your preferences and giving you some uh, personalised information based on uh, that kind of um, information that you've provided it. Another one is Google Nest. I quite like this example because, you know, Google Nest originally was, you know, the hub where you put your calendar, you put everything on there and you say, sweet, great, you know, give me information about actually what's happening. You know, tell me when my calendar is or when my housemates are out. Now it's changed a lot. So now you can have all these add-ons. So one of those cameras there is using AI to learn the people in your house. And then if it detects someone it doesn't recognise, it sends you an alert saying, hey, there's this new person in the house. You might want to check, you know, are they an intruder? Are they a friend? Um, have you been broken into? You know, that's a new thing. Um, again, as a bit of a Subi fan, we've had driver assist in cars for several years. Um, who has a car with some sort of like self-driving capabilities in the room? Fair few people now. Um, what's interesting with cars is driver assist and self-driving cars. So cars actually have a one to five or zero to five scale of AI and self-drivingness. So zero on the scale of AI in cars is the car has no automation or anything whatsoever. You have to completely completely drive the car yourself, you have to use a manual gear stick to change it, no electronics in the car whatsoever. And level five is the car drives itself. Now, a lot of people say, oh, we've, we've kind of almost got that now. But the, the other levels we've had for years, like decades even, you know, um, who, who had the first power steering cars in the room? Like power steering was one of the first like levels of AI in cars. Um, not so much AI, but you know, like this automation, like computers actually helping us drive. Power steering, uh, line assist, you know, we stay in the lines and things like that. Um, alerts and beeps when you go outside the line. These are all forms of AI in cars that have been around for a while. Um, another personal favourite, it used to take me hours to get rid of backgrounds in Photoshops. And now I can like click on my thing and like click a button. It's not perfect, um, but it like removes the background for me. And obviously I can, you know, change it, refine it a little bit. But this used to take me hours 
hours. I do um, thumbnails and things for YouTube. So it just took me forever. And the fact that they now have um, this new type of um, Photoshop AI is fantastic. I saw a tweet last week too where there's... Um, an even newer style of AI in Photoshop where you can like select on parts of the photo and like, oh, if my hair wasn't long enough, I could like make it like drag my hair and make it longer. I could turn my face to a different way. I could smile if I wasn't smiling. Like AI and these kind of things are just becoming crazy. Um, not so mind blowing now, we also heard it in the keynote, is AI and artwork. This is one I created in Mid Journey. But we know that artwork and um, you know, this uh, stable diffusion or um, image creation from, artwork, from AI is becoming much more common. And to the point where a lot of um, photography competitions are actually being won by people who are using AI to completely generate the image. Now, I think this is a, is a bit crazy, but. Um, if you haven't tried out some of the artwork, it's actually pretty incredible. I find it does better with like, um, you know, uh, cityscapes and it doesn't do as well with people. Um, but cityscapes and stuff is great. Um, as a journalist, I find this one a little bit um, maybe good because it helps me write articles quicker, but maybe not as good. This one's been around for years, Fiesta. This was trained on over 8 million different articles on the internet to help people write journal articles. Um, now, when I first found that, I was like, whoa, that's so cool and awesome and sweet. I've never seen anything like that. And now we obviously have ChatGPT. Um, so if you haven't used ChatGPT, I highly recommend it. Who's used ChatGPT in the room? Yeah, quite a few people. Now, it's obviously been trained on lots and lots and lots of lines of human language. So obviously, it's a natural language um, responder. And as you can see, it's not exactly, um, well, this one here isn't, um, isn't specifically for me, but what's really good about ChatGPT and what I think is like where it really um, excels ahead of uh, a lot of people is it writes really good prose. It's not necessarily factually correct, which is why you need to um, check ChatGPT's Chat responses. And Sarah in the audience here, she has a fantastic way of thinking about ChatGPT, which is it's an intern. If you got a work, work from an intern, you would never submit that to a boss. You should probably check it. Um, but it's really good for doing lots of um, low lift things and uh, be able to you know, kind of help you start it on your process, unblock you, um, get you places. I think ChatGPT is really good for that. Um, but definitely check the um, responses. Um, another one, if you were in my talk last night uh, or even um, previously, GitHub Copilot. Um, this is obviously the, the FizzBuzz uh, example. A lot of people try to um, you know, solve when they first start programming. GitHub Copilot is an AI pair programming tool and it can basically synthesize code for you, which is awesome. I, basically, I don't have to do anything now. Um, I can write these um, pretty decent functions using, um, using AI. Uh, so these things are really good, right? Is like they actually do a lot of things that people are doing. They're becoming much closer to that definition that IBM showed us before, which is mimic the uh, decision-making capabilities and human solving or problem solving that the human brain can do. And I think it's doing quite, doing quite a lot of these things. But again, everyone's still actually worried about, you know, this whole idea is actually, will they take our jobs? Like what kind of jobs are at risk? And, and is my job at risk of being taken um, by a robot. Now, obviously, this whole idea of artificial intelligence is making the conversation even more, um, I think, more discussed throughout every single industry because, again, it's changing so quickly, right? And it's, it's like we're seeing it come into every single industry. So I think this is like where it's still like, Ooh, like actually what's going to happen? Like, are we actually worried? Um, now at GitHub, we've obviously um, launched GitHub Copilot. And when we first launched it in 2021 at GitHub Universe, a lot of developers were asking that question. As a developer, do I still have a job? Is it going to be good to work with this type of AI? So at GitHub, we didn't want to, you know, sit around and ponder and think and twiddle our thumbs and go, do people actually want this stuff? What's it going to be like? Developers are going to use it? Is it going to steal people's jobs? No, we actually went and did a research study on it. So we recruited 95 um, professional developers. 
So these are all developers who are quite senior in, the, in their role. We split them into two groups, randomly, mind you, and we decided to give them all a task of writing a web server in JavaScript. Now, not everyone likes JavaScript, um, but these people were you know, more than capable of completing the task to some degree. So we decided to split them into two groups. We gave um, half of that group uh, access to GitHub Copilot, which is our AI um, tool. And we gave the other half, don't, know, don't ask me why it was 45 and 50. I probably would have gone like more 48, but you know, I wasn't running the research. As a scientist, this really annoys me, but it's fine. Um, so 45 of the developers in the group used GitHub Copilot and 50 of them didn't use GitHub Copilot. And what we found was that of the 45 that used GitHub Copilot, 75% of them completed the task to you know, create a web server in JavaScript within like, I don't know how much time they, they were given, they're probably given a limit because you don't want to be there for days. Um, and then the 50 who didn't use GitHub Copilot, 70% of them completed the task. Again, as a scientist, I kind of look at that and go, okay, well, that's, that's an 8% difference. Is that really like that mind blowing? Like, is it I really good? Like, I know people talk about productivity and saving money and dollars and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, is 8% like, to me, 8% isn't really that big of a deal. But what was really interesting was the time it took. So we looked at the time it took people to um, complete these tasks. The people who used GitHub Copilot, it took them an average of one hour and 11 minutes to complete their task. Of the people who didn't use GitHub Copilot, it took them two hours and 41 minutes. I don't know about you, but I can think of a lot better things to do. I can spend my time for an extra hour and a half per day. So I think that was the really big difference, right, is this whole idea of, you know, things being a lot quicker. Obviously, they are much more enabled to do their job. But I think what was um, interesting there is actually looking at, like, okay, people, were people actually excited to use this stuff? And a lot of the, um, the feedback we got was that they would never use um, GitHub Copilot, or sorry, they've never code without GitHub Copilot again. Um, it just really enabled them to, you know, free up their minds, going back to that, the whole idea of, you know, when writing was invented, free up their minds to do the boring mundane code stuff while they did the problem solving. So that was really interesting. Um, and what we also looked at was, okay, well, these people who are going to be using, um, you know, GitHub Copilot in future and, you know, what were kind of some of the kind of skills that they would then require? Obviously, they would still need some coding skills uh, to be able to do this. But the type of people that are going to survive in this age of AI, the type of people who enjoyed using GitHub Copilot, you know, making really good use of it, what kind of skills do those people have that define them? So this is from a, um, a study uh, that LinkedIn did in 2020. I cannot for the life of me find uh, more updated statistics, but a lot of companies have been putting out like their top most desired skills for the future of work. And in fact, a lot of these skills are the things that, you know, we look at when we look at the co-pilot studies and the people who are using AI really effectively, they have a lot of these skills, right, for this future of work. And again, these are the most in-demand skills uh, currently or as of 2020 when I couldn't find any more updated. You can see creativity, persuasion, collaboration, adaptability and emotional intelligence. So it was what's really interesting about this too is that a lot of, because I've been tracking this every year for like the last few years, which is why I'm annoyed I can't find the new ones. Um, but some of the, the, uh, the soft skills that actually dropped off this list in like 2018, 2019 were things like business management, time management. Like, I'm pretty good at time management. That was always one of my things. I'm really good at time management. Nobody cares anymore if I'm good at time management because AIs and you know, calendars and all these like productivity tools can do that for me. So it's not even a most like a desired skill anymore. But these ones really are. And to kind of like um, compare them alongside this, the hard skills, these are the most in-demand hard skills. Now, if you look at some of these hard skills, obviously AI is up there, um, but a lot of these hard skills would be um, useful because you're coding the next generation of um, new technology. So blockchain is obviously a big one. Cloud computing, so think, you know, your Azure services, your GitHub code spaces, things like that. Um, you know, being able to sort of reason analytically, although I suspect that one has probably dropped further down the list now since AI has become much more, more of a thing. Um, and UX design as well, being able to design things that are um, 
really centered around the, the user experience there. Um, so let's go back to this idea or back to this um, link then. So if you've still got it up on your phones, uh, pull it up, pull up the link there or just do it again if you haven't done it. And what's really interesting about this, yes, it gives you the percentage likelihood that you are going to still have a job in future or that the percentage likelihood that a robot can do your job. Actually look underneath and it gives you the skills that are required for your job that you can do versus the skills that a robot can do. Now, I really wish they would update this because some of the skills now, I'm like, oh, robot can do that now. Um, but it gives you, here's some people are giggling in the audience, but it gives you um, an, an idea, right? So like, for example, I put in like developer and it was like, um, you know, a robot can update website content. A robot can resolve computer software problems. Um, they can install hardware, create electronic backup data, update knowledge, monitor the security of digital information um, and test software performance, among other things. Some of the things that it said a robot can't can't do now. Obviously, this is you know they're slightly um, getting out of date, but recommend changes now. If you've used ChatGPT or anything recently, uh, even GitHub Copilot chat, which I'll show you in a bit, um, it can actually start recommending changes and things now. Um, so provide technical support for computer network issues. Uh, is they reckon something a robot can't do? Provide recommendations to others, customer service, collaborate, um, document design or development procedures, um, network uh, related activities, troubleshoot issues with applications or systems, write code, although obviously it can do a lot of that now, um, develop models, perform, but you can see a lot of the skills that's saying that a robot can't do is a lot of this piece around collaboration, um, you know, talking about how to do your work, your, uh, do documenting it, um, being able to um, basically convince others that what, you're, what you do is really good. Um, now, if we have a look at some of these, um, these robot applications, so like for the first one, for example, like Mid Journey, um, this is one I created in Night Cafe which is um, like a stable diffusion, kind of takes all the Dali Mid Journey all together. Now, if you look at this, um, I can't remember the exact prompt that I used, but we can see the AI is not always perfect. As people, we can sit here and say, that doesn't look quite right. Um, you know, this person up on, which I don't know, this side of here, I think has got like kind of three arms happening here or something like that. I can't, can't quite work it out. Um, that's, that's like extra fingers. Someone's like missing an arm. Like it's not quite right. Okay. But like as a, um, as the AI, it goes, well, that that's, you know, that's right for me. That's what you told me you wanted. And I've like produced that thing. Um, we can see too that um, context is really important. So this is one I created um, and I just wrote in the term dog. And I was like, I wonder what, wonder what I'm going to get. Now it's obviously giving me some like neon thing. Um, this random like D-dog written in the background there is kind of um, odd. And it's kind of got like some car thing um, happening over here. And there's like, I don't know, a couple of dogs there. And like, one, like it's, like if I wanted a photographic picture of a German shepherd looking all beautiful with a summer coat with blue skies in a park, but I've only written dog, but that's what I was thinking. I haven't given the AI any context to go by, right? So again, it's like if I Googled apple, like you could be talking about a million types. You could be talking about an edible apple. You could be talking about Apple, the computer. Like you, know, you need to give AI context. Um, so I think what, you know, one of the things I said before is like you get a lot better results with like, um, like cityscapes, you know, when it's not people, because as people, we really see um, the mistakes, for lack of a better word, in AI-generated artwork if it's a person. You know, they might be, their eyes might be weird or they're missing something. Um, has anyone used the NVIDIA RTX um, vision thing for your camera where you can like be on a meeting and it like automatically puts your eyes into the camera? Has anyone used that? Is there a couple of people in the room? Yeah, there's a couple of giggles. It's kind of freaky. Like it doesn't really quite look right. Like, and you can't really explain how it looks wrong. It just just doesn't look right. Um, so a lot of that thing, um, you know, this kind of like it doesn't look quite right is because we're not telling the AI. The AI can't read our brain. And also the AI doesn't understand things necessarily as well as like somebody else does. So if I say to, um, you know, to, like, and we're talking about something, like, you, you know what I mean? Like, and, so, and you, you get, like, that's a thing amongst human, like, uh, language and human um, conversation that I don't always actually have to explain myself. But 
the AI doesn't actually understand that. We need to explain ourselves to AI. However, if we do, and we spend lots of time in this kind of um, AI generated um, environments, we can actually get some pretty incredible results. So these are a couple of um, images that my friend who you spent literally hundreds of hours in mid-journey um, refining prompts and figuring out the best way to do something. Um, he spent lots of time on it. He was able to produce these amazing images. And I look at that and go like, that's I'm a bit of a Pokemon fan as well, but like these are like quite incredible, right? And again, back to this idea, he, yes, he spent obviously lots of money on it as well, but he spent lots of time. He refined what he was asking. He was really, really specific with what he was asking for. Same thing if we're using ChatGPT. Now, I know a lot of you said you've used it. So for example, if I say, do you know about NDC? And it's like, yes, NDC stands for New Distribution Capability. Now, if I was talking about NDC, the conference, you know, the Norwegian Developers Conference, um, I haven't given uh, the chat GPT any of that content. So I just said, have you heard of it? Um, I also like to talk to chat as if I was talking in person, like, hi, chat, how are you going? Um, sometimes it's like, I'm good, thanks. What can I help you with? Um, yeah, but, it, but I actually haven't given it any context. But then if I ask this, you know, what about, you know, in the context of developer relations, I'll put it up there on the screen again, just in case you missed it. It's like, oh, right, you were talking about in the context of developer uh, uh, conferences. Yeah, sure, it may refer to, I like how it says it may. It's like, I'm not going to be wrong. I'm going to tell you, it may refer to this. Um, but if I give it that context, it's now able to give me something um, much more closer to what I want. Again, think about the idea of Googling. You know, the more specific you are with the prompt that you're asking for, the better search results you'll get, right? Same thing happens with AI. Now, again, um, like, for example, if I ask it, you know, who, who am I? Um, now, this, this comes back to this idea. I like this too. As of the cutoff, that's when it was last trained. Um, but, you know, as of, you know, this date, um, this person, Michelle Manor, is an Australian technology and gaming leader developer. I was like, ooh, this sounds very nice. Um, now, some people are giggling in the audience. They're going, hang on, wait, you have a PhD? No, I don't have a PhD. As I said, ChatGPT is really good at writing prose. If I gave this to someone um, who never had met me before, maybe I looked a little bit older so that I look like I probably held a PhD, you would look at that and go, wow, that's a very impressive bio. Like it sounds really good, right? But it's not factually correct. And so that, I think that's, you know, one of the places that people can have is actually coming in and, um, you know, re referencing and making sure these things that uh, the AI is giving us is actually, um, you know, actually correct. Uh, this is another example I have from, um, you know, doing some JavaScript. Now, if I just ask it, you know, reverse a sentence, it gave me, you know, a sentence there, like, you know, how to reverse a sentence. Like, but if I wanted more and I'm, I need to give it more context, I don't just want the sentence reversed. I want to, you know, make, do all these other changes to the sentence. Um, so this is actually pretty incredible, this kind of stuff with GitHub Copart. Now I'm going to skip the rest of this little thing because I want to show you some of the other cool stuff. So if you want the rest of this demo, come and ask me because, um, yeah, this is a really fun one that I created. But what we actually um, announced really recently is GitHub Copilot X, which is like the next phase of, of um, GitHub Copilot, which is actually incredible. So basically it just allows you to like, exp explain this file to me, um, fix the bugs. So again, it can now like detect bugs and fix things for you. But like AI is becoming much more sophisticated. And if anyone has been tuning into Microsoft Build, Microsoft just announced Microsoft Copilot a couple of weeks ago. And this morning, yesterday, they announced Windows Copilot pilot, which is like, you know, how do I do all this stuff on my Windows machine? You know, Microsoft Copilot, build me a 10 slide PowerPoint presentation on AI and the future of work. Blah, here you go. Like, it's just, this stuff is just so incredible um, at the moment. And I'm not going to show you um, some more demos. I've got some demos of GitHub Copilot chat there. Um, that's the Microsoft one as well. But I really wanted to get into this idea of um, you know, all these things and the reason why it's called um, GitHub Copilot, Microsoft Copilot, Windows Copilot. Yes, they're the same company. Yes, you can't trademark Copilot, but that's beside the point. The reason why they're called Copilot and why I think a lot of other companies will probably follow suit is this idea of pair programming, not necessarily just in, um, in coding, but in all types of your work. So these things are called Copilot because you are still the pilot 
pilot. You are still in charge. You still direct the computer and the thing to do what you want. It is there to actually enable you and help you do your job. So let's have another look again at these skills for the future of work. So again, this idea of creativity, persuasion, collaboration, adaptability, and emotional intelligence alongside these hard skills, which are actually quite um, useful now. But these five skills, how do we actually get them? Like, it's great that these are the five skills that we need to do, but how do we actually get them? I'm gonna spend the last six minutes talking about how you actually get these skills to ensure that when you leave here, you go home feeling good about yourself because you actually uh, feel good that you will have a job in the future of work alongside all this AI. Now, the first thing I'm gonna tell you to do, who hasn't used any AI tool in this room? Well, a couple of people. The first thing you need to do is go and use these tools. Try out ChatGPT, it's free. Try out GitHub Copilot, it's free for 60 days. Try out Midjourney or Dali or like one of the other Copilots or one of the other AI tools. Try them out. Importantly, when you try them out, really understand what they are doing. Understand where their limitations are. You know, what does this thing, you know, what is it not good at doing? And then understand how you can provide the value there and then work alongside it. You know, one of the worst things that you can do is like, oh, you know, it's, I'll be fine without, um, you know, AI and I'll, I'll still have a job and things like that. Every single industry is going to be using AI. If you're not using it, you're going to be behind. But also if you're not using it, you don't understand where the limitations of this software lies and therefore where you can actually add value. So definitely go and try them. The next thing, hackathons. One of my code names is the Hackathon Queen. I love hackathons. I think these are fantastic places to practice, utilize and learn a lot of the soft skills needed for the future of work. So who's been to a hackathon here before? coding competition or even like non-coding, non-technical hackathons. I run lots of hackathons around like law and climate change and all other kinds of things. They're basically problem solving competitions or problem solving events. They go along, you know, think of a problem, you know, think about some ways to solve it. So the first thing there is you're thinking, you're using problem solving, you're using critical thinking. You often work in a team. So that's really important to understand that teamwork. Um, you use a, um, a lot of that emotional um, intelligence and adaptability. Oh, I know we've um, thought about these five ideas and I really like my idea, but I have the emotional intelligence to step back and say, your idea has been voted better. It's actually probably a really good idea. So let's go with that. You're learning a lot of these skills that you're going to come up against in work. Those things are very important to work alongside AI. Um, now, again, teamwork is one of my favourite things. So try as much as possible to collaborate with your team members, whether it's within your own team or within other teams within the company. Collaborating will actually, you know, will allow you to learn from others, will actually allow you to practice all of these skills. And, you know, you can actually learn to help put the team first as well, aside from your own like personal goals and things like that. Another thing I love is hiking. Now, I'm gonna call this out right now, not everyone can do hiking for whatever reason, whether it's um, accessibility, um, whether it's physical or financial or whatever it happens to be. Uh, I know not everyone can do hiking, um, but I really like it for these things. So if you can't do hiking, find something else that uh, will kind of do these things for you. But one of the things about hiking is you really build resilience. Has anyone done any hiking here, like multi-day hikes as well? Like, you're carrying a really heavy pack. You have all your stuff for the last one I did was six days. All your stuff for six days on your back. And, you know, you often have to contend with the weather going bad. Um, you know, you've got to have the... Um, the uh, motivation to get to the next phase. You know, we've just got to get there. You know, let's have a break for lunch. Okay, now we've got to pack, we've got to keep moving. Um, you often have to put uh, the needs of other people in the, in the hiking group before your own. I think hiking just really helps build up a lot of, um, a lot of that intelligence. And, and when you get back, it actually gives you an added bonus of giving you this like, um, thankfulness for some of the, the smaller things in life, like, you know, having a hot shower uh, after weeks. You know, so I, I love hiking for that reason. I think it really helps build up the resilience. So definitely do hiking. The next one is curiosity. Now I say this because a lot of people do things for the sake of doing things. 
Don't do things for the sake of doing things. If there's a process in your team that doesn't make sense, why is that process there? Is there like something that you don't understand about it that is actually a thing? Or is it just there because it's the done thing? So having a curious mind can actually help you, um, you know, overcome all of those challenges and actually show your value and worth alongside um, a lot of these computers and things. So like ask, ask the questions basically. Don't just settle for something because it's the done thing. Um, and finally, I think this is my final. Yeah, this is my final one. Is always be learning. I did university. You don't learn everything you need to. In fact, you basically learn nothing. You learn most of it on the job. Um, but always be learning. Learn from your colleagues. Learn from your teammates. Learn from conferences. You're all here at a conference, so you're doing that already. Uh, learning never stops. So never. And I know none of you think that here for the simple fact that you're actually in the room learning about something right now. But learning never stops. Never think that, oh yeah, I've, I've done my course, I've done this or I've done that. I've been to NDC like five times. I've learned everything there is to know in the world. Um, that's obviously not the case. So always be learning. Think about how can I learn more about these AI systems, about my job, about what somebody else is doing. So be learning. Uh, and then finally, if you would like to look at some of the resources from this talk, I've got some fantastic articles there uh, on GitHub Copilot, on the study that we did um, for those developers. If you want to like make sure that I was actually quoting the right numbers and things, you can have a look at that. Uh, there's a really good article that one of my colleagues wrote on prompt engineering and that that, setting that context to AI, that's there. And there's a really good uh, video on our GitHub CEO writing a, um, a GitHub app um, in 18 minutes, I think he did it, Web Summit Rio, using GitHub Copilot chat. And then finally, because you know you'll want to learn, there's um, a link to all the free learning resources online for things like Coursera, where you can learn from Princeton and Stanford, all those kinds of things. So I know we're one minute over. So if you have any questions, please find me uh, either throughout the conference. I'll be back on Friday. I'm actually giving a talk in Poland tomorrow. So I'm flying to Poland tonight. Um, but find me on Friday, or you can also ask me on one of the various social media platforms known to man. So I will try my best to get back to you. But I want to say thank you all for coming and learning um, here today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your NDC. Thank you all for listening.